Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror, number 15. This was an annual comic that Bongo Comics would put out, uh, Matt Groening's comic book company. And it would, uh, just like the episodes of The Simpsons, the Treehouse of Horror episodes, they would have crazy weird stories out of canon if you will horror science fiction and um the fun thing about the treehouse of horror comic book is that every issue would try to get artists that would never normally draw for bongo uh they'd get like jeff darrow to do a center spread or dan brereton to do a horror comic or mike allred all these interesting artists would do stuff um sergio argones did a bunch of stuff um but this one is especially weird because this issue is guest edited by Sammy Harkham of Kramer's Ergot fame. Um, pardon me if I pronounce that wrong. I, I have almost every issue of Kramer's Ergot. I love them. I still don't know if it's Ergo or Ergot. So um, I don't know. Uh, Kramer, so uh, also of Cricket's fame. Great cartoonist. Great editor. If you're a fan of Kramer's Ergot. I mean, you know he's a great editor. One of the best comic anthologies of all time. And uh, it's up there with Raw. So he uh, got all these other indie artists to do Simpsons stories. And it's pretty fun and just pretty crazy. Um, I'm sure they couldn't go wild. You know, it's still like PG rated Simpsons comics, but uh, some of these are pretty nuts. The cover is by Sammy Harkham. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not by Sammy Harkham. It's by Dan Zetwatch. Or Zetwak. And I don't know this guy's work, but I really like it. This is a really interesting. Um, it, it's all these cartoonists, almost all of them, you can kind of tell their styles poking through, but they've all subdued their normal styles to be more like on model with the Simpsons comics. So, I mean, this is pretty much looks like a normal Simpsons cover. And uh, I love how it fits in almost every character, all the main characters. Like, you could look at this for a few minutes and find all these little things in here that are pretty fun. <laughs> all these uh, characters and stuff. It's very weird, though. I don't read a lot of Bongo comics. I think he does this on all of them, though. Is even though this is clearly credited on the contents page to Dan Zet... Um, sorry, Zetlock. Zetwalk. Matt Groening signs his name to it. It's not like a copyright notice, like, hey, this is my stuff. He just signs his name as if he drew it, which is really kind of lame. <laughs> it's like Walt Disney, you know? Or I guess even it's like Stanley Presents. And uh, throughout the comic, you'll see that a lot of the stories have these credits to Matt Groening, even though he had nothing to do with them. And even though they're credited to these the real artist who drew them, Matt Groening still sneaks his signature in. Uh, I don't know. I don't like it. Because <laughs> I really like Matt Groening. I admire The Simpsons. I love The Simpsons. Kind of like Life in Hell. Never a big fan. But uh, it's kind of weird that a guy who, like, you know, grew up reading underground comics and came up through the indie comic strip, alternative comic strip field, would do something like that. That's why it kind of irks me. You have a nice contents page. Drawn by Sammy Harkham. He gets to sign it, and he almost signs it in the same font as Matt Groening does. As a kind of homage. And there is no Matt Groening on here. And uh, uh, signature, I should say. But uh, this pretty creepy drawing. It's the, it's the intro scene of every Simpsons episode. But all the characters are just like body parts poking out from under the sofa. There's Lisa's leg. Bart's head is in a drawer. It's pretty uh, horrifying. The first comic we have is Cloud 13 by Tim Hensley of Wally Gropius fame and other Fanagraphics publications. Once again, Matt Groening signs it. <laughs> he had nothing to do with this comic. But this is a really great one. Uh, I love it's. It's basically like the intro to The Simpsons, but everything's like spookier. Like um, when Maggie's being uh, scanned at the checkout counter, it's this monster. 
But the weird thing is, is that this is all Lisa's like nightmare. She, uh, she's in therapy talking to the therapist who is obviously, uh, I can't remember the names of those, uh, life in hell rabbits. One of them, I don't know, Binky or something. And uh, she's telling him about this nightmare where everything's off, you know? Just a, just a very odd little strip. But like I said, look at look how on model this is. I don't think this would be jarring to any uh, regular Simpsons reader. The next one is The Call of Vajulu. And this is written by Matthew Thurber of 1-800-MICE fame. If you haven't read that comic, you should. It's fucking hilarious. Really great indie comic. Just um, pretty brilliant stuff. And it's drawn by Kevin Huizenga of Ganges fame. Uh, if you haven't read Ganges, it's a... God, I don't know how many editions there are. Various comics and graphic novels. And they're by, by Kevin Huizenga. And uh, kind of very um, slice of life -y. Um, at least the more modern, the recent stuff, but he's a great cartoonist, just a great style. And his style is poking through a little more in this comic. He can't quite subdue his own <laughs> drawing style to the Simpsons model, even though it's pretty close. So this is weird. It takes place in this like world where the whole economy is collapsed. So it's kind of post-apocalyptic. I mean, it's not like, you know, mutants running around or anything, but it, the world is very, you know, basically, uh, it's lawless. Burns, for some reason, has become, has gone green. He's all organic, and uh, he's into all, you know, being good about the environment. He's wearing this suit of armor that's solar panels. <laughs> I like this. He says, oh, yes, I've lost my fortune and holdings in the economic collapse, but I shall rise again like some kind of Granola Osiris. I'm sure there's going to be a band called Granola Osiris pretty soon. This came out, by the way, I should have mentioned in 2009. And uh, so this is a while ago. So meanwhile, elsewhere, we see Millhouse, Lisa, and Bart. As we can see, they're definitely off model. Their faces look pretty close, but they're, I think they've grown up. So he makes them look more like teenagers, body-wise. And they're going to squat at Burns old mansion. Because, you know, Burns lost his mansion when he lost his fortune. And they break in, and they find Burns old accountant. And he's just howling to himself. He's gone bonkers. And uh, he tells them how uh, Burns started going green, but in a really crazy, stupid way. <laughs> like, he put dirt floors in the reactor, which was completely, you know, against the health code and the nuclear commission. And then he started talking about getting messages from the ancient Vegulins. And uh, I guess uh, Burns put a, made the accountant put a tax write-off so huge that it ripped a hole in the fabric of reality itself. He looked into the hole, this accountant, and it burned. It seared his brain. That's what made him crazy. But this rip in reality has brought uh, the ancient Vagulans or Vigulans to Earth. I should say, it's just a bad pun. It's supposed to be Cthulhu. It really doesn't work as a pun. It's really stretching a pun. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the hole in reality starts sucking them in. Uh, they, it gets Millhouse. But Lisa and Bart escape. Bart makes the mistake, though, to turn back and looks into the hole in reality. And it really messes him up. And it's almost like it's turned him into a Vigulin. He also has some physical problems because of it. And I, I guess uh, Homer lost his job when they closed down the nuclear power plant. 
So he has no insurance. So he has to go on this game show where uh, it's called America's Next Top Patient, where it's a contest where the prize is you get some health care. That's how bad things are. So later on, they're all in their treehouse. I guess uh, Bart and Lisa and all the teenage, the kids in the town in Springfield have like turned into a little gang to survive. And they live in Bart's treehouse. And Millhouse shows up. And Lisa says, how did you escape? And then Millhouse starts <laughs> vomiting up the shit. It was his whole body weight. And it turns out like Millhouse was just a husk holding this. Uh, maybe it's from that other reality. Bart says it's a sign that Vajulu will soon be here. So they go to uh, the the Springfield Mansion. I think that's where the mayor used to live. And because uh, that's where Krusty has been transmitting a pirate radio station since the fall, since the collapse. And I guess Krusty's been spouting all this Fajulu stuff. Welcome, brother, to the age of the plant, year zero. And then Vajulu shows up, at least at one little tentacle branch of him. And Cressy says it's time for Vajulu to take over. And there's Vajulu. See, it's very H.P. Uh, Lovecraftian. So Lisa jumps into that hole in reality and it sends her through time. She goes back to before the collapse and we see this like marketing.com type whatever. And I guess they created it just as a, a marketing platform, a marketing campaign. And then all of a sudden Burns in his solar armor shows up. <laughs> he says, time to reap some profits. The end just doesn't make any sense. Somehow Burns went through that hole in time, I guess. It's a very silly story. I really like this one, Blurst Again. Parody of R. Crumb's famous comic strip, uh, Stoned Again. Which was like a very popular poster during the hippie era. But Bart is a... Has these, uh, a bubble pipe and it makes them blurst. I love that. That's just nuts. That's by Jordan Crane, by the way. This next comic is a uh, Mo Bodies, Mo Problems. And uh, it's written by Ted May. And drawn by Sammy Harkum. Ted May's a, uh, if you haven't read his stuff, he's really good. Started off with Tales to Demolish. And then he started doing that injury comic. And God, he's done so much since then. I can't, I probably don't have half of them. I wish I did. I'm just not rich. But I love Ted May's stuff. Really funny writer. And in this comic, uh, Mo is trying to make his bar more lady friendly. And then and Nicrobopo's just like, is that a pair of soiled briefs in the window? <laughs> she, of course, she leaves. It's uh, Mo's not having an easy time of it. I like this art though, Sammy Arkham, with the shading. You know, very on model, but also like different than your average Simpsons comic. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, Gil is there. If you're a Simpsons fan, he pops up every few episodes. He's the the nervous salesman. And Mo is saying, you got any special deliveries for me? And Gil is just like, I'm trying, Mo, I'm trying. He's like, I'm not really cut out for this line of work, but I need the cash. So uh, Gil comes back with a big sack. And Mo's like, wow, a great, you got a corpse, great. But then he looks at it closer 
And he's like, this lady's been murdered. Or as Mo says, this lady's been moited. And uh, he's like, I only hired you to get me corpses for my immoral reanimating project. I didn't expect nothing unsavory. I can't pay for this. So that's Gil snaps and he pulls out a knife and he's going to kill Mo. And then all of a sudden, Nelson falls from the ceiling and cracks Gil on the head and knocks him out. Moe's like, there was a gremlin living in my ceiling? Holy crap. Gil falls right in his knife, so he's dead. <laughs> of course, Nelson goes, ha, ha, because he fell in his knife. So he says, what were you doing with my ceiling? And Nelson says, sometimes I spy on people. That way I'm around to laugh derisively when they screw up. <laughs> so that's how Nelson does it. He's always there. So uh, he says, come on, help me with this body. And he takes him down to his basement. He's kind of got like a Frankenstein laboratory going on. He's been working on this project. So uh, it works. He makes this like Bride of Frankenstein creature. Or I guess it's going to be more like a Bride of Mo creature. Definitely interesting layouts for a Simpsons comic. Colors are really weird, too. Apparently, um, I think this one is colored by Ted May, but the Grand Comic Database, all the other ones didn't credit. For some reason, this story, they think it's colored by Ted May. None of the others are credited. And the colors are really neat in this. Very interesting. So I'm pretty sure each artist colored their own story because they do look, you know, like the kind of colors you'd see in Kramer's or, or Go. I think it's our go. I'm going to see that from now on. And uh, his bride of Frankenstein starts working at the bar. She puts up all these pictures of Brad Pitt strategically because Moe's so ugly. Whenever he wants to kiss her, she needs to look over and see Brad Pitt and pretend it's him. But because of all these beefcake pictures around, all these women start coming to uh, Moe's bar. So it works. Of course, Smithers is there too. And then there's a final gag. <laughs> and Nelson's still in the ceiling going, ha ha. This one's really nice. Uh, the Gods Must Be Lazy by Will Sweeney. Um, I'm not familiar with Will Sweeney, but he uh, apparently draws a comic called Tales from the Green Fuzz, which I definitely want to check out now after seeing this because it's really nice. And... It looks like we're in Olympus, you know, and we see this god named Portlius Maximus, great god of chubbiness. And he's looking at his human chess set. Yeah, I guess the gods just play with us, you know, we're just pawns. And he picks Homer and Bart, who are uh, on the ship. And all of a sudden the waves rise up. I like how the foam of the waves are these, like, god-like monsters or monster-like gods. And they're just in for a ride. They see what they think is a Kraken at first. Turns out to be Neptune. I'm sorry, Poseidon. And Poseidon uh, helps them out. And he uh, escorts them from the clutches of Portlius Maximus, drops them off on this nice little island. <laughs> we look up at Olympus, and I guess uh, Portlius was getting a meal. That's why he was away from his chessboard. And he says, hey, get away from my stuff. So back on the island, Bart... And Homer, or I guess just going to try to survive. I like how Homer makes this spear and just tied a spearfish to the end of his spear. So while he's uh, playing with his chessboard, Portlaeus is eating and he's, he drops an onion ring onto the board. So all of a sudden this giant onion ring monster appears and starts chasing Barton and Homer. Then they run into the tri a tribe of pickle people <laughs> with bows and arrows. And they chase them into this cave, which kind of looks like Portlius' is his face. And uh, the pickles know better. They stop right at the cave entrance and get down on their knees and start worshiping. And then the cave mouth closes, chomp. <laughs> Very strange story. I like the art a lot. 
So this is a Sammy Harkham drawn page. Really nice. Contributors of the Damned. I love this picture of uh, Groundskeeper Willie here. The colors and the silhouettes of the trees. That's a great drawing. But uh, it's a really nice page where he uh, does these great portraits of all the contributors. But, of course, they're all monsters and ghouls and scary things. Next we have... Uh, oh, i got to check... Oh, John Vermilia. Uh I think I must have seen this guy because he has been in Mome. I have a lot of Momes, those the great anthology that Fanographics put out all through the 2000s. Maybe into the teens as well. We start off in the sewers. Hans Molman's doing his job and the radiation is off, uh, meter is off the hook. We realize it's because Homer's been dumping toxic waste into the toilet at the nuclear power plant. Hans Moment gets doused with a giant blorping of uh, toxic waste. So he comes out of the sewers and he's got a taste of human flesh. He's a chud because he's cannibalistic, humanistic. And he's an underground dweller, which is the three criteria for being a chud, according to the chud handbook. Um, kills Nelson. <laughs> kills uh, Millhouse when he's taking out the garbage. God, that's great monster drawing. Look at that. This guy's really good. I want more stuff by this guy. And like I said, look at these colors. I'm pretty sure this guy colored it. This is a really fun, zany colors that I don't think a normal Simpsons comic would have. <laughs> he kills Rod and Todd. They think it's God. And then uh, he goes to Ralph Wickham's house, and Ralph looks out and says, Mommy, is that you? You've come home? <laughs> I don't know why he thinks it's his mom. And he breaks in, and Chief Wiggum comes in, with his gun, and he thinks the same thing for some reason. He's like, honey, you're back. And he says, I thought you were a chat or something. Now we can be a family again. And uh, there's this nice montage of them having all fun and games as a family. <laughs> the millhouse is stuffed. And Ralph is just freaking out the whole time, most of the time. They're looking at playing with Rod and Todd's heads and they're having a great time and Ralph is just like, ah. And then the last panel, the ch uh, chud just winks at us. Really like this art. Great stuff. This next one is called the bootleg. And uh, shit, gotta check again who this did, who this is by. Oh, this is by Ben Jones. I don't know much about Ben Jones. Let me check the contributor page. I'm sure I've seen his work before in anthologies. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure he was in a lot of Kramer's Ergo. Picture Box put out his stuff. That great little publisher. So we see Apu and his brother, you know, who run the Quickie Mart. And his brother is like, dude, man, we got to be careful. These bootleg products we've been getting, they're really dangerous. They're going to kill people. We're going to be in trouble. And they show... The shampoo is uh, is like real poo, as Ralph Wickham says. And the toothpaste is made of fecal matter, too, apparently. He says, my teeth are browning, browning not whitening. And I guess they got all this uh, boot-like candy. And it's like poison, basically. Meanwhile, we, we cut away. We see Lisa. She's just uh, got her official vegan membership card. I like this. What's that, Mom? I can't hear you. I'm busy being vegan. And she's <laughs> trying to annoying on her forehead. I That's a stereotype I don't really get. I know a lot of vegan friends, and they're not shitty about it. But apparently... A lot of people feel threatened by vegans and think they're annoying and obnoxious just because they're vegan. So Bart and Homer eat some of this poison candy. They die. And uh, 
The brother's like, see, I told you. What are we going to do? And Apu thinks about it by taking a shit. That's how he does his best thinking. And he says, hey, we'll just get bootleg humans to replace the people who die from the same company we get this shitty bootleg merchandise from. And so they do. And as you can see, they're bad bootlegs. <laughs> they're very off, off brand. Apple is very villainous in this. I mean, he's completely immoral. He's just like, I don't care. We're going to keep, I don't care if people keep dying. We'll just replace them with uh, bootlegs. Pretty soon the whole town is bootlegs. Rod and Todd have Satanist shirts on. Like, obviously, they're, they're off-brand. Otto's wearing a poncho and a giant hat. See, this is so Kramer's ergo looking. This kind of crazy, weird art style for the backgrounds and stuff. Even though the faces look very odd model. Very weird little jokes here and there, just very odd. So I guess the last hope is uh, the comic store guy, because he's used to dealing with bootlegs. But Homer shoots, shoots him. Very silly. Here we have John Kirschbaum. I love this cartoon. It's a really funny guy. He, he, I think he did comics from Mad Magazine even. But most of his stuff has been fanographics. He, I remember he came, uh, I think he got a Xerox grant for his first comic, The Wiggly Reader. I remember buying that when it came out. Loving it. Just thinking, man, this guy's just a consummate funny cartoonist. Like even when he came out, he was like that. He was just, his style was dialed in. We see this uh, Three Little Kids, it's called. It's basically the Three Little Pigs. And we see uh, Ralph Milhouse and Bart. Uh, Mr. Burns is a werewolf. And one by one, he's uh, eating all of the, the trio we saw. But then Bart makes a house made of bricks. And the werewolf can't get in. I'm sorry, Mr. Burns can't get in. In fact, when he tries to blow it down, he dies. <laughs> I'm so, yeah, he uh, hyperventilates and faints dead away. So Bart eats him, puts him in a stew. Then, like, Little Red Riding Hood shows up. But it was actually Homer <laughs> strangling him. Just so weird. The three little bears, they just mix up all these things. We've seen those all these things parodied so many times, but John Kirschbaum still finds some funny jokes to to wrench out of these old uh, fairy tales. It's pretty funny stuff. Here we have Bad Millhouse by uh, that crappy indie cartoonist Jeffrey Brown. Um, hate his stuff. Really didn't dislike it. Hate his drawing style. But this looks okay to me. It's a uh, <laughs> kind of... He, sh he I wouldn't mind if he drew more Simpsons comics. I like the coloring, too. It's very these warm colors, very unlike your average Simpsons comic. And uh, Millhouse is the star. He's riding his bike one day, and he kills one of those twins. I can't remember their names. And the other one, he actually, I mean, he accidentally kills the first one. And then he bonks the other one on his head, on the head with his bicycle seat and kills her. So he tells his father, and he's like, here, you're going to have to hide in the crawl spaces of the house. Don't come out for any reason. Chief Wiggum comes and says, where's your son? We think he may be involved. But, uh, so basically, Milhouse is going to have to hide there forever, or a long time. Milhouse accidentally kills his father when he tries to open the trap door too quickly. So now he's kind of stuck in there. So, you know, he's living in there for a while. Pretty soon the Simpsons come and buy the house because it was foreclosed. See, this one you could tell that icky, shitty art style of Jeffrey Brown is poking through. <laughs> a 
But, um, yeah, what, what do we have? Oh, yeah, so Milhouse is, of course, still in the crawl spaces. And he spies Lisa and he's in love. This is, I just realized it's like a typical Jeffrey Brown comic where you know, the main character has a crush on an underage girl and wants to pursue it. So there's just so many weird things in this comic. Like, all this time, Millhouse has been drawing this epic graphic novel based on Harry Potter in, in while he's been living in this house. Very <laughs> strange. So Milhouse finally comes out and confronts Lisa. And uh, they just kick him out of the house. So the jig is up. Chief Wiggum ha happens to be there and says, you're under arrest. You've escaped justice for too long. This com next comic is, uh, I guess it has no title. It's just The Simpsons. Let me double check. Oh, the Slipsons. I don't get that reference or the pun. But this is an odd comic. I mean, it's just a bunch of crazy, surreal shit. But it's really good. I really like it. It's like some dream you'd have after watching a thousand Simpsons episodes in a row. Some weird dream you might have. Look at this craziness. So nuts. We have an evil Flanders to ramp, finish off the story. So there you have it. The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror, number 15. I definitely want to get more of these. I, I know they're not going to probably be as interesting, but this is fun stuff. I always love the Treehouse of Horror episodes of the TV show. So, you know, I'll probably like, I always d dug those, the different takes on the Simpsons, the alternate realities and stuff. So I hope you enjoyed looking at it. I, I had a good time uh, reviewing this last night, getting ready for this video, and uh, made me miss watching The Simpsons. I haven't watched The Simpsons in quite a while, but I forgot how much I love them. Another thing is you can tell all these artists grew up watching The Simpsons, and they get so many of the inside jokes, the running gags. They definitely know The Simpsons, which makes them a lot better at these comics because it's like... You got to know something to sat satirize it or parody it or whatever. Pay homage to it. And they do a great job. So hopefully I'll see you next time here at the Hercules Pettix Academy of Comic Book Studies.